Spotlight is a production of CTNY, the Catholic television network of Youngstown. It seeks to spotlight people, places, and events from around the Diocese of Youngstown that promote the new gospel of joy called for by Pope Francis. Your program host is Father James Corda. Hello and welcome to Spotlight. I'm Father Jim Corda. Joining me is Father Jeff Mickler. Welcome to our show. Delighted to be here, Jim. And we're talking about uh, Father Alberioni, who uh, is the founder of your community, the Society of St. Paul, and recently you celebrated 100 years. Let's, let's give the folks that are with us uh, a little background into uh, Blessed Alberioni and the beginnings of the orders uh, 100 years ago. Well, he was born in uh, northern Italy in the Piedmont region, an area known for very hard workers and shrewd business people. He came from a poor farming family and, like all farming kids, knew how to work from the earliest possible age. He was a man of very small physical stature, but throughout his life he'd have great energy and creativity. His family was steeped in traditional Catholicism with devotions to Mary, uh, to the various saints, and early on he felt called to the priesthood. And so he entered the seminary uh, to study to become a diocesan, diocesan priest and to begin a life of service to the church. Tell us a little bit about uh, historically what was going on at the time that he when he started seminary, but also as he created the order? Well, the Industrial Revolution had had crushing effects as well as great effects on the world. The church was feeling it as well. As people move from country to city, they would oftentimes lose their faith. In the factories, uh, they were working in England 16 hours a day. There were situations in which child labor was the norm. No one questioned it. Well, uh, the church responded with Pope Leo XIII, his great encyclicals, Rerum Novarum, addressing those social issues. And Blessed Alberioni in the seminary studied those and asked himself the question, what can I do to make things better and to bring the wisdom of the church to a suffering world. And of course, uh, you know, there was the, uh, on the verge of, of World War I. So tell us a little bit about the obstacles that he might have encountered uh, when he was uh, struggling to build the society. Well, as a very young diocesan priest, they immediately put him in charge of the spirituality of the seminary, mm. which was quite an honor and showed the confidence they had in him. Well, he was praying over this, these matters and he could see different qualities in the seminarians that could be utilized for a new pastoral ministry. Now, when he himself was a seminarian, on December 31st, 1900, all the seminarians were in the Cathedral of Alba praying all night long before the Blessed Sacrament. And he determined on that night to do something new for the people of the 21st century. Well, 14 years later, he began to see what was needed was a way to talk to the people who weren't in the parishes but were still in the church. And he saw newspapers, radio, television, no television, take that back, right? At that time, uh, they didn't have that. But those social means were corrupting them more. So he wanted a good press, good radio, good film, and anything else human ingenuity would come up with, including television later on, where he could reach with the message of Christ those people. But of course, there are many obstacles within the church and in culture to that vision. Now, how, um, how uh, different was that at the time? We've got about four minutes left in our first segment. How difficult was it at the time to utilize these tools of communication that many people looked upon not as 
good instruments, but as, you know, maybe even propaganda sometimes. How did he wrestle with all of that? Well, the diocesan papers were very weak, and there was a very weak one at the time, uh, the Alba Gazette, that he envisioned as being reinvigorated, the, addressing actual needs of the people. And how to do that was a big question mark. Now, he grew, drew around himself a, a number of the best seminarians who clicked with him and said, hey, this is something we want to do in our priesthood and live out our priesthood in this way. And the first thing he did was found a trade school for printers, mainly high school kids. Uh, most children would uh, stop their formal education at eighth grade. And using that trade school, he started producing right away religious pamphlets and books and getting vocations from that group of young people. Uh, the bishop also gave him a green light on this, which was very important. And there was a lot of questions about whether we'd ever have an official recognition in the church, but he went ahead in faith nevertheless to do it. And uh, he had the Holy Spirit with him, so it would succeed beyond what anyone's early expectations were. Now, of course, this all took place in, in Italy. Mm -hmm. So uh, things were going on in Italy at the time. Uh, would he have ever imagined or dreamt that this ministry and this foundation in order that he started would have become worldwide? He did. Um, charism is the point in which human genius and divine grace intersect. Right from the beginning, he realized this was a universal need for the church and actually a universal need for humanity, where so many of the means of social communications were used for propaganda and promoting error, he felt that it can be used to promote truth around the world. So right from the beginning, he had that intuition that the society of St. Paul would be like St. Paul, go from one country to the next country to the next country. And that was part of his original intuition. Let's uh, define uh, briefly, before we take a break, the word charism. It means a gift. It's a gift from God to the church and humanity. And God has showered thousands of charisms upon the church which we see embodied in various religious congregations, lay institutions, all types of ways that God has blessed the church. Now, now I think that the charisms have to be alive and growing and developing, and they are all doing that under the power of the Holy Spirit. We're gonna talk more about that in a moment, but we're gonna take a quick break. Please stay with us, we'll be right back. Hunstons enjoy Friday dinners out, nothing fancy, just time together to reconnect as family. They make sure others eat as well. By giving to Catholic Charities of Youngstown, the Johnsons join other angels who care for those in need, regardless of religion or race. Show your wings with a gift to Catholic Charities, changing lives one family at a time, providing housing, emergency financial assistance, senior services, and more. Give now at ccdoy.org. Hi, I'm Mark Quinn. As I grew up on the south side of Chicago, the Dominican Sisters of Springfield not only taught me, but formed me in my Catholic faith. The sisters worked for very, very little. Now as they've gotten older, they have no savings to fall back on. And we benefited from their sacrifice. And I think it's time that we recognize that much of what we are today, we are because of what the sisters did for us. It's our turn to help them out in their hour of need. They don't ask for a lot. They embrace a simple life. I owe them so much. That's why I make an annual donation to the Retirement Fund for Religious. Do you remember the religious men and women who shaped your life? Say thank you to them by donating to the Retirement Fund for Religious at your local parish. Join me, share in the care. 
Welcome back to Spotlight. I'm talking with Father Jeff Mickler of the Society of St. Paul, and we're focusing primarily on their founder, Blessed Alberioni. We, we concluded our first segment by talking about the word charism and how that uh, is indicative of many religious institutes. Uh, how has that charism, uh, if it has, changed and grown within the Society of St. Paul over these many centuries? Well, right at the original intuition, he knew that he wanted a congregation that would have not only priests, but brothers, because in that trade school, he could see young men that were definitely creative, talented, and he wanted to utilize for spreading the gospel, but they weren't called for priesthood. And so he envisioned the brothers making up two thirds of this congregation and maybe the priest one third and that together they would be spreading the word of God with the printing presses and the other means uh, that the brothers could utilize as their pulpits to preach to the world. But within a year, he also envisioned the daughters of St. Paul, how to draw women into this communications apostolate. And so it would be with other branches of the so-called Pauline family that he would be praying, meditating, and God would reveal to him, let's do this, let's do that. So the charism would start expanding to embrace more and more types of people in his lifetime. Let's take a pause now and talk, uh, let's interject about vocations mm -hmm. at this point. We won't spend a lot of time on it, but let's talk about uh, how important it was at the time to uh, invite young men to consider being a brother within the Society of St. Paul. And was that going on in other communities as well? And then what about um, the, uh, the sense of how that is today within the society and within other religious orders today? Well, the brothers had already always been a part of various congregations. And some of the congregations are made up exclusively of brothers consecrated men dedicated to one mission or another, taking the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Now, there was in Italy at the time a lot of clericalism and anti-clericalism, and some people would only want their child to become a priest because it would have prestige, it would have financial security, etc. But the brotherhood vocation then and now was not really well understood. Nevertheless, Blessed Alberioni saw that as going to be part of the backbone of our congregation. So we went against the tide a little bit on that uh, issue. And it was very important for the congregation and its growth and development. The other uh, brothers that would be part of clerical institutions many times had very secondary roles. Um, there are Jesuit brothers, there are brothers in uh, various congregations, uh, but their role was not put in the same way that Blessed Alberioni placed the brotherhood role in the Society of St. Paul. Now, uh, let's talk primarily now about uh, Blessed Alberioni you know, in the lives of saints, they are the people oftentimes who fly in the face of the fashionable. They're the ones that think outside of the box and, and sometimes go against the tide of what public opinion is. Uh, what was going on, do you think, in his mind and heart when he was uh, beginning this new community? And uh, was his vision fully realized in his own lifetime? There's two elements. First, on a spiritual plane, he simplified. He wanted the spirituality to be based on the Eucharist, Eucharistic visit, celebration of the Mass, and the devotions would be somewhat limited because in northern Italy there were thousands of devotions, so he simplified, but focused. And he wanted Jesus to be honored under the title Divine Master, Way, Truth, and Life, Mary, Queen of Apostles, and St. Paul, the Apostle, would be considered the real founder of the congregation. That was quite a simplification, but also a, a really focusing. He also wanted daily meditation. He wanted his men to think every day, to pray every day. 
And he developed the spirituality around that. Then in the apostolate, they had to be on their toes to try to get the best means available at each stage of development for the sake of the gospel. So he had those two elements. Uh, he went against the tide in the sense that there are many people that were very devotional <laughs> and in, a, in a, a, an emotional way. But he also went against the tide in bringing into the church a new way of educating people. Basically, Catholic schools and universities were accepted. This way was not understood at all. And so many dioceses around the world were very hesitant to let the societies of St. Paul enter them. Now, let's talk also about some of the people that were part of the early beginnings of the society. Uh, one in particular is Father Giacardo. Um, how is he, uh, what's his role within the Society of St. Paul from its early beginnings? Well, Blessed Alberione was lucky and fortunate to have very strong and good men around him. But because of his universal vision, he moved first from Alba to Rome, showing that this was not going to be simply an Italian order, but a universal order. And then from Rome, he sent out his best men around the world, including Father Francis Barano, who came to the United States. But blessed Timothy Ciccardo, he was like his right-hand man, his aide-de-camp, uh, the one that would get things done for him. And I think every leader of every group needs an individual like that. And blessed Timothy Ciccardo was not only an organization man, but a profoundly spiritual man. And he understood journalism, writing, etc. And he worked on helping forming and reforming the spiritual heart of the Pauline family, especially within one group, uh, the pious disciples of the Divine Master. And their task is to serve the priesthood in general, uh, to promote the liturgy, support the liturgy, and to spend large periods of their lives before the Blessed Sacrament praying for the church. And Blessed Timothy Ciccardo was their main spiritual director and their guide. Now, we're going to take a break in just a minute, but define the, the title you're using for both uh, Alberioni and Giacardo as Blessed. Well, there are stages in the Catholic Church for reaching canonization. And the stage of being blessed, blessed is the stage right before their final canonization. And there's a canonical process having to do with investigating miracles, etc., that take place in this final stage. But to get to the blessed stage, it already shows that their life has been very well vetted looked upon, the, the value of their life, their holiness is pretty well accepted so that you can even honor them in the Eucharistic prayers, etc. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. April 4th, 1884, born in Italy, James Alberioni was the fifth of seven children. At 16, he entered the seminary and felt the call of God not only to priesthood, but to spread the word of God through modern telecommunications technology. This innovative priest saw the instruments of communication as the most rapid way of making Jesus Christ known to the modern world. Congratulations, Society of St. Paul, on 100 years of proclaiming the good news. Doesn't your child deserve the best education possible? Then you should consider a Catholic school where strong academics are offered in a safe, disciplined environment, where education is deeply rooted in the religious teachings of our Catholic faith, where graduation rates are exceptional, where outstanding teachers help your child reach his or her fullest potential in the classroom and in life. But you should consider a Catholic school for the most important reason of all. Your child is worth it. Described as the heart and soul of the Pauline family, Father Timothy Giacardo was the first priest of the Society of St. Paul and its first teacher. For three decades, Blessed Timothy grew in his ministry as a true teacher who would form scores of young priests, 
brothers and sisters, in the spirit of St. Paul, through the society that bears the Apostle's name. Congratulations, Society of St. Paul, on 100 years of proclaiming the good news. Welcome back. I'm talking with Father Jeff Mickler of the Society of St. Paul. Uh, Father Blessed Alberioni, um, his, his, his group, the Society of St. Paul, has grown exponentially over these hundred years uh, into um, uh, institutes, foundations, lay apostolates. Explain some of those different facets of uh, what falls under the umbrella of the Society of St. Paul. Well, we call it the Pauline family. And the first big branch uh, that sprung up was a year after us in 1915, the Daughters of St. Paul, who were to also work in the communications field, share our same spirituality, our same apostolate. They are currently in about 50 countries. The Society of St. Paul, we're in about 35 countries uh, across the globe. Wherever we're at, we take our charism and we adapt it to the particular cultures while also adapting to the ever-changing communication culture, which is like a, a, a continent in itself. But he also founded in the late 1920s another group, the Pious Disciples of the Divine Master, because he saw the importance of spirituality and especially Eucharistic and liturgical spirituality for the church as a whole. And these sisters, uh, besides uh, making liturgical vestments, they're, they have been architects, they have been artists, they are people who take care of retired clergy as well as the active clergy, and they are generally a delight of spirituality whenever you encounter one. They take care of the 24 hours a day of Eucharistic adoration in St. Peter's in Rome. So if you've ever visited there into the Eucharistic chapel, those are pious disciples. They also answer the telephones in the Vatican telephone system, which we, the Society of St. Paul, run. So there were the three first big branches. But then he began over the decades seeing other needs in the church. And he also wanted to bring into the Pauline family consecrated lay people. And so he founded one group, the Annunciationists, who would be single women who would take the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience according to their state in life. They would never marry. And they would go about with their careers and their life, but bringing Christ values to those careers whatever that might be, and also supporting the Society of St. Paul. They'd be under the directorship of the provincials of the society. Another group, the Gabrielites. They would be men, again, taking the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, working out their careers, and also trying to bring Christ into the workplace in various ways and situations. But one of the fastest growing branches is the Holy Family Institute, mm -hmm. where lay married couples or married individuals, widows or widowers, can enter this group, and they also take the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience according to their state. They're not celibate, but they take the vows according to their state, and they participate in our spirituality. And if you've ever seen them taking their vows, renewing their vows, you see how emotional, deep, profound it is and how much it means to them and to their life. At a time when there are all types of unholy marriages, this is a very important aspect of the Pauline family. In the United States, we probably have 250 members in the Holy Family Institute at the moment, and that is growing because people are hungering for that charism, that grace that could be found there. So you can see how the various aspects of the Pauline family uh, take on different forms in different situations. Uh, Father Jeff, we're down to the last four minutes of our time together. Recently, this earlier this year, you were in India mm -hmm. and you uh, gave uh, a series of presentations uh, to uh, at your community in India. What was 
the society of St. Paul like there? And what's the church in India like? Well, the church in India has a huge impact on the nation, even though it's very small in numbers, where maybe we only make up one and a half percent of that gigantic nation. But because of the Catholic schools, the educated elite, many of them have been formed and reformed in Catholic education systems. Uh, they are very devout in their Catholicism, very intense in their Catholicism. And as a result, our congregation, the Society of St. Paul, the pious disciples of the Divine Master, and the daughters of St. Paul, all are growing very quickly. And you can feel the dynamism of our young members, of our seminarians. They're taking on all types of new ways to communicate on, to Christ to that nation that really needs to hear it. And there's so many things I could talk about on that, but I was very edified and strengthened by what I saw there. We know that uh, modern telecommunications changes uh, rapidly and daily. Uh, how does the Society of St. Paul, who utilizes these, to these tools, how do they change and adapt as well? Well, in India, just to take an example, we started up a communication school, St. Paul's Institute of Communication Education, which is for Hindus, for lay people, etc. But that forces our own men to be on the cutting edge of things. But just by the nature of our apostolate, whether it's in book publishing, which is now taking on electronic forms, whether it's in audio publishing, which is being delivered over the internet, you're, there's a tidal wave of change that you're carried along with, much like a surfer on a wave. And if you don't keep on your toes, you'll be wiped out. <laughs> now tell us uh, briefly, because we're down to the last minute uh, of our time, uh, in this celebratory year of the Society of St. Paul, how in your estimation has it changed uh, and grown? But then what are some of the challenges that lie ahead? Well, we have to take satisfaction on what has been accomplished, but not rest on our laurels or even long for an earlier, simpler time. We have to face the moment and the crisis in the world community and see how the truth of the gospel is the only truth that will give stability and justice and hope for humanity, which is just sort of like flailing around in darkness and needs that light. And we hope all of our instruments are bringing that light to so many people. Well, Father Jeff Mickler, thank you for being with us. And thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. Spotlight has been a production of CTNY, the Catholic television network of Youngstown. Your program host was Father James Corda.